live on Facebook. We're live. Hey, hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Mindset Explosion, season three, episode number 38. And tonight we are taught, I'm joined by awesome Paul Wilson. Hello. I, you didn't have that t shirt on a minute ago. That's a cool t shirt. That's my favorite superhero uh, character as well. You knew that, right? Um, I, did, I knew that. I knew yeah. that I'm telepathically, you know, yeah. one of my skills. <laughs> Um, tonight we're going to talk about how to remove unwanted baggage. Uh, Paul, you're a mindset coach. Yeah, and and, okay. yeah. We're on mastermind together with um, Gary Das uh, through Progressive, is, which is pretty cool. It was a complete coincidence, you know. I like I was just saying to you a few minutes ago. Um, I signed up to this thing through the social media, and then there was a mastermind mentioned as a kind of added bonus. And personally, I think the mastermind is worth the value of the whole course because of the interaction you get and actually meeting people that you w probably wouldn't meet face to face in a in a group setting or online, which is great. Yeah, we can't might we might get sidetracked here, but they're quite. I feel they're quite powerful, especially you know talking about mindset. So being around like minded people, um, I think it's quite important, isn't it? Oh God, it's, it's paramount. I, it's strange you say that. I had a, a message today on my phone, which I need to turn off. Excuse me a second. I forgot to do that. To put it on now. Um, sorry, go. Um, a message from a friend of mine's dad. And he was saying to me that, uh, you know, me and my daughter have been talking for quite a few years now about positive mindset. And she says that I need to get away from negative people in my life. And he messaged me and said, I've got this partner, we've been together a long, long time. Long story short, she's a pain in the ass, very, very negative kind of person, always dragging him down, always referring to stuff that happened in the past. And I asked him a couple of questions. Look, is she making efforts to get rid and deal with this stuff? And he went, no. So I said, look, you're not going to like this, but your daughter is absolutely right. This person is holding you back and holding you down. And I don't know how this works, but we all give off. Like, I'm not talking woo-woo here. This is facts. And let me give you an example. Have you ever been in a, in a group setting, you know, like in a party or a meeting, and you're, you're having a conversation with someone, and then you suddenly hear your name being spoken of all the hubbub, and you turn and go, what? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And another yeah. one, have you been sat in a cafe? I know this happens to a lot of women. Have you been sat in a cafe or a pub? And you're sitting there by yourself or chatting to someone, you think, someone's staring at me, someone's looking at me. And you kind of look around and there's a bloke in the corner that's like, you know, not maliciously, probably thinks he recognizes you or something, but we send stuff like this and nobody knows why. So it's not woo-woo, it's actually scientific facts. And when you're with people that are always negative, always in a bad mood, always giving it this kind of thing, yeah. you know, <laughs> it brings you down as well. And yes, you've got an incredible sense of self-worth and a really sort of positive all the time. It just really, really drains you down, which is why it's so great to be in a mastermind with, with people like Matt and the others, because we're all in different businesses. We're all talking about how we can do better, how we can help our clients better, how we can get ourselves out there. So it's a really, really good kind of positive collective, like a hive mind. Yeah, definitely. I, I, that's actually because obviously we're going to talk about uh, how to remove mental baggage, but in a way, that's kind of part of a mental baggage sometimes, isn't it? When you kind um, maybe I'll speak a bit from my own experience here, Paul, but um, you know, because you just kind of touched on something there in the, my past where um, just people are, I was a working environment I was in, it just didn't become very healthy for me. And I think it started to, you know, if one person was miserable, it seemed to like bring everyone down. And then I would take that, I take that with me. I just take it home, I think. I think like a lot a of people do, a lot of people do that. I read a story a few years ago about um, a doctor, a GP in, in the States. And um, he was having a really, really hard time because like GPs over here, he was seeing lots of patients, couldn't have a, lots of clients, you know, didn't have a lot of time to spend with them. So it was like, come in talk for two minutes, write my script, come in, talk for two minutes. I'm really sorry you got cancer, you're going to die. And all of this day and after day after day after day. And he was getting really down. He was going home. He wasn't talking to his kids. He was ignoring his wife. And he was becoming a real pain in the neck, to use his own words. And one day he went to his conference and he met this retired doctor who's about 95, you know, big smiles, really healthy and, and sort of still fully, you know, 
uh, compass men to still know what was going on. And he got talking to him and he explained to this sort of senior doctor what was going wrong in his life. And he says, you know what you need to do? Says, God, tell me, what, what do I need to do? He says, when you go home, you might need to change your house a little bit. The first thing you do before you, you see your kids, before you kiss the dog, before you pat your wife on the head, you have a shower. He says, what do you mean? You walk in your door, you go into the shower room, you take all your clothes off and you get in the shower and you imagine that the water is draining off all the sad news, all the negativity, all the bad stuff you've had to sit through on that particular day and watch it wash away and go down the plug hole. Yeah. Do that and then go and spend your evening with your family. And this guy was a bit skeptical. That's a bit woo woo for me, but he mm. did it. And after about a week, he said, it was incredible. I'd go home after a really crappy day. Instead of taking all this baggage with me from the day, all the bad news and the deaths and stuff, I'd just jump in the shower. Imagine like this old guy said, you know, I'd wash myself and watch it all run away down the plug hole. And I just felt great. So again, it's a, a very, very simple act, a very, very simple thing to do, but it works. And it's just a really good way of getting rid of the crap from your day. And so many people like you, Matt, they're having a tough day at work and they go home and they either hit the bottle or they hit the crappy food or they just do a combination of all of that, don't talk to anybody, isolate themselves and feel miserable. Well, if they took a very, very simple little step, like you know, having a shower or doing something to separate the work day from the home day, they'd feel so much better, absolutely. I, I, do you know what, Paul? I really like that. I, I, I might add, obviously, you're a hypnotherapist as well, aren't you? As well as a mind, uh, mindset yeah. coach. So, obviously, that's the power of the mind. And I guess it is those little things that makes a difference. It's sometimes, you know, I, you know I, talk, I, I teach martial arts, but just how we might stand someone will affect, you know, how they, their posture changes and their confidence grows or their self-discipline. Um, so it's a very similar thing. Those little tiny things, I guess, um, become a little anchor, would you say? Uh, yeah, definitely. The, I studied Tai Chi for a few years and then my teacher disappeared off the face of the planet. He'd gone rogue and so I couldn't do it anymore. But you're absolutely right. Learning, I'd be trying to do a move and it was becoming really wooden and rigid. And he'd come along, kind of like push my elbow out here, drop this one down, tilt my head. And the move just became all of a sudden much, much smoother. Yeah, just by a couple of tiny adjustments. We have incredibly powerful imaginations, amazing imaginations, but we don't use them. We, we yeah. tune it out. And so this doctor story I was telling you, that's a great way of just simply using your imagination, of picturing the, you know, the negativity just, I mean, obviously it doesn't drain away because you can't see negativity, can you? It's invisible. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. Picture it. You know, the soap on your body is the negativity. If you picture that and imagine that and practice it, it becomes real. And you can get to a stage where you can actually feel it draining away from you and your body just feeling much more relaxed and really, really comfortable and happy with yourself. So, yeah, the, the imagination is a hugely powerful tool if we use it and, and work with it. Definitely. I and mean, you're, so, you're so right that we don't use that enough just in terms of any kinds of forms of vision, but we probably are. That's sometimes, you know, where we get this um, negative um, baggage is probably because we use it in the wrong context, right? Would you say? Uh, yeah, because with the, the story of the, the dad, he's around this person. So she's, well, this person was like giving him loads of grief all the time. So there's a physical connection of negativity, mm. but there's also... Like, imagine he's at work and then he's oh God, I've had a really bad day at work and now I've got to go home and I've got to put with put up with her or his nagging and bitchiness and oh, I, just, I can't face it. So even before he's left his day's work, he's setting himself up by imagining a negative scenario. Right. Um, this is what worry is. If you think about it, what does worrying do? What does it achieve? Yeah, nothing really, is it? And the old cliche of spilt milk. Imagine yeah. we still had bottles of milk, okay? So I took a bottle of milk like this and I dropped it on the floor. 
by accident. There's two ways I can react. I can go, oh God, I've just dropped a bloody bottle of milk on the floor. That's, you know, £1.50. And I've got to go and get all the towels. If I don't get it all up, it's going to stink. And I can build this really big, horrible, negative picture about what I've got to do. And that just creates stress in my body. Whereas if I go, oh, bugger, I've dropped the milk, and then go and clean it up and get on with it, and then get on with your day. It's two, it's the same, it's the same event. The bottle of milk has been spilt and dropped and smashed, but it's two completely different ways. So yes, I still get angry for five seconds or 10 seconds, but then I move on from that and just deal with the situation and get on with my day. Too many of us will dwell on negative situations. Like my boss just chewed me out because I was late with the report or I only made five calls instead of seven calls today. And you take that home with you and then you take it out on your kids, you take it out on your, on your partner, or you go down the pub and you, your, your mates around the pub commiserate with you, oh, have another pint, Paul. And, you know, you go home after you've had four pints and you wake up in the morning with a groggy head. So you kind of perpetuate the negativity throughout the entire week because of one single event. Yeah. Again, it's just because of the, the power of our imagination. It's just it's a humongous tool that's there as a resource. And we don't use it in the right way, most of us. No, definitely. Uh, it's really interesting. And, and I guess if we're surrounded by, so I, now this scenario is we're surrounded by people who are very much like that. Would you say that can feed upon us a little bit as well? We, you know, so, so if I'm surrounded by five people every day and they're just completely negative, how is that going to affect me? You know, piranhas, yeah, in the, in the Amazon or wherever, and the, the big teeth and they sort of devour stuff, yeah? Imagine you got um, a warthog and you dropped it in. Mm. The piranha is going to come and they're going to nibble away and nibble away and nibble away and nibble away. And over a period of time, that carcass will just be bones or maybe not even bones, just bits of fluff floating around in the, in the river. And then eventually just gets dispersed and goes away. That's what happens to our, our spirit, our sense of self, our positivity. So you've got all these people snipping and sniping away and it just pushes you down and pushes you down and makes you feel like crap and makes you want to have that extra bottle of wine or eat that extra big cake and feel sorry for yourself and feel angry and negative and then you spread it as well yes so you go home and your wife your partner might be full of the joys of spring because he or she's had a really great day your, your kids are jumping up and down doing what kids do and you go home and I'll stop doing that. Stop doing that. Where's my dinner? Uh, 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 you know, uh, and you just spread the negativity around because like we said earlier, we haven't kind of separated. And if you're in a negative atmosphere at work, you did the right thing. You got out of it. Yeah. Two minutes, don't do that. We, we, we put up with it. We make excuses. Oh no, I've got to stay here. I've got to put up with it and I've got to accept it. And, we don't take action to deal with it. And that's the worst thing. So I, I think one of the reasons, you know, you see a lot of people that are kind of mature, that they're kind of stooped over. They're not standing up kind of proud in your Yeah, head. no, they're it's like shoulders. that weight, isn't it? <laughs> it's like, it's like the, the, they're like this and the yeah. weight of the world and they're walking around with these big bags of invisible stuff on them. And then, you know, the weight of the world is on their shoulders. And I'm convinced that a lot of negativity in the workplace, in the home place, just adds to this baggage and it just kind of weighs you down like you're carrying, you know, a camel's worth of stuff on, on your back. It's like a backpack of rocks, isn't it? Each one is another rock, another rock, and we're not taking the time to bloody take them out. That's a great analogy. Yeah, yeah. it's like you've got a rucksack yeah. that's with no lid on it. Yeah. Time, you know, something negative, somebody goes, here's a nice big stone. Just going to drop that in Paul's rucksack. Oh, yeah. God. And then you go into an office and you have a meeting. There's three people there. One uh, is a big rock for Paul's rucksack. And, you know, and you go home at the end of the day and you're like bent over double because you've got this great big bag full of stuff that you've collected over the day. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, that's the reason why I, I left my job of 25 years because I'd, I'd had a fabulous time that I'd really enjoyed. It's really challenging times. And the last couple of years, I've been transferred into a role that wasn't really me and I gave it a really really good go I did my best effort for two and a half years and then on October the 3rd 2017 I got knocked off my bicycle on the way to work 
and I broke an arm. I broke an arm either side of my bone. <laughs> I broke a bone either side of my elbow, and I'm right-handed, which meant that I couldn't do anything at all. So I was signed off work for six weeks, and I was sat there thinking, should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? Should I go? If I stay, I'm going to make everybody miserable. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to spread the misery. But if I go, what am I going to do? And I went back to work after those six weeks. And I still to this day don't understand what happened. But, you know, you, you go back to the office, you're trying to get the computer working. There's all the mail you've got to sort through. And the HR director walked past my office and went, hi, Paul, how's the arm? I went, oh, it's great. Went, Have you got a minute? And you come around to my office. Long story short, six weeks later, on the exact date of my 25th anniversary, I was out. Because something inside me said, Paul, this is an opportunity. Let's jump on it and let's go. And I was going to become a photographer because photography is my passion. And I really, really love taking pictures. But I talked to a few professional photographers. And they said, Paul, every man, dog, budgerigar, cat, snow leopard with a, a phone nowadays <laughs> calls themselves a professional photographer. Yeah. And yeah. people are working for nothing. People are working for uh, exposure and all this kind of stuff. So it's a really, really, really tough slog. And I thought, well, I don't really want a tough slog. I want, you know, something that I'll keep the photography as a hobby because I don't want that to become a, a chore that I've got to do it. So I was 2018. I was having a ball. I was doing all these kind of different things. I did a 15 week stand up comedy course. I did a social dynamics course, took on a personal trainer, did all kinds of different things. And the personal trainer was qualified as a hypnotherapist. They said, Paul, look, we've got this uh, one day event coming up. Why don't you come for free and give it a go? So why not? I've got nothing on that Saturday. Went and did this thing, worked with a lady. She, she was petrified of snakes and worms and wriggly things. And we got a really good result. I thought, yeah, okay, fine, but you know, whatever. The very next day, I got sent an email. Uh, her family were walking in the woods and dad was a big video guy. So he's got the, the camera out and he's videoed everything. And he goes, but darling, you better, you know, move to the side there. And he sort of zooms into the path and this massive, really long worm. And he expects his wife to kind of detour around. And she goes, no, 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 don't worry, darling. And she walks up to this worm, gets down on her hands and knees, very, very carefully, very gently, picks it up in her hands, takes it over to the grass and puts it down on the grass. Husband nearly drops his phone, lets off a stream of expletives, yeah? And I'm thinking, bloody hell, I've got a superpower. Because I couldn't even show, the day before, I couldn't even show this woman a picture of a worm on her phone before she was freaking out. And there she is, less than 24 hours later, doing this, you know, rescue of a worm kind of thing. Wow. And I just had to find out more. So I spoke yeah. to a personal trainer. He put me onto the guy who trained him. So I studied with him. Then I found out who he'd been trained by. So I went and studied with them. And in the end, I worked with about uh, half a dozen different people and got trained. And I just love it. And yeah, okay, it pays the bills. But the thing I really, really enjoy about the work that I do is that there's a moment, I call them an instant, and it's when the client gets this look on their face and they suddenly realize that all the crap, all the garbage, all the unwanted baggage that have been carried around for five, 10, for a lifetime has suddenly gone. And you can see them kind of like doing this, <laughs> looking around to make sure it's actually gone and not hanging around somewhere. <laughs> and then basically the, the whole face lights up. The, their eyes become like those beacons from a, a lighthouse and their face starts to shine and there's a big smile from ear to ear and I know we've cracked it. And I just love that moment, that instant. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And that's why I do what I do. Because yeah, I mean, I help people transform their lives and change stuff and all that. But it's that, that, that instant, that moment that really does it for me. It's, it's massive for me, it really is. It is special. I I know the what yeah I know a similar a, a similar thing it is very special it's it's nice to see definitely because you know that and, and you know that they, they've obviously shedded something but they're they're off to great things right that's it you know I mean I've I've had clients that have been smoking for thirty years and they've tried to stop 
and they've, they've tried this and they've tried that and they've tried the other and they've never been able to stop for three or four weeks or five or six weeks, but they're always back to smoking again. And I remember this one particular lady and we were working together and it turns out that the reason why she was smoking, she was also eating too much, she's quite a big lady, is that because she'd been in a very abusive relationship years ago and she'd sort of escaped from that relationship, but her subconscious mind had said, we don't want to be near blokes ever again. We don't want another relationship as long as we live. And the subconscious decided the best way for that to happen, the best way to guarantee not to be in a relationship was to make herself as ugly and as unpleasant as possible. So she started eating loads and loads of crap, put on loads of weight, and she started smoking like a chimney. And quite rightly, you know, she didn't attract anybody. Mm. And so when we did the work, when we unpacked it, that's what we found out what was going on. And once we'd found out that out, we dealt with it, and uh, you know what, a year and a half later, she's lost loads of weight, she's not smoked a cigarette, she's got a really nice guy as a partner now, and she, she's loving life, always with a massive great big smile on the face, simply because we found that one thing. Because a lot of people, you know, you probably hear this in your classes, Matt, about people say, I've got this nagging voice inside my head that's always beating me up, always doing this, yeah? yeah. Well, there's a misconception. People think it's trying to hurt you, trying to hold you back. It's not, because mm. our brain has one function, one prime function, that is to keep us alive, to keep us alive. Now, the challenge we face is that our society has evolved incredibly. I mean, we put people on the moon, we, we build dwellings, we've got you know things like this that give us access to the, all the information on the planet, yeah? But as, as creatures, we haven't evolved very much in a million or so years, yeah? So inside our head, we've still got the fight, flight, or freeze response, and our brain hasn't kind of catched up, or caught up, rather, that there are no saber-toothed tigers, and that in the West, particularly, there's no nasty snakes and, and groups of predators around the, the corner. So it's kind of translated that into negative events. So, for example, I'll give you an example out of my life. Back in 2002-ish, uh, at the Channel Tunnel, I was health and safety advisor, got told to do this public speaking event, and it was a nightmare. I did everything, every single thing wrong you could do in a public speaking scenario. You know, death by PowerPoint, I didn't know my material, too many words on the screen, it was, it was awful, and I was sweating like a pig. I had a green a lime green short sleeve uh, shirt with a tie on. And within about five minutes, it was, it was black. And there was sweat <laughs> pouring off me. And it was, it oh. was awful. And I was in this room built for 20 people with about 40 people in it. It was way too hot. And the worst thing about it was everybody was trying to pretend that there was nothing wrong. And in the end, I just said, look, I've got to go. And I went and let my boss kind of take over. And from that day onwards, I swore I would never, ever do a public speaking event ever again. And so that's what happened. My, every time I got an opportunity, my subconscious mind went, no, remember the Sabre 2 Tiger back in 2002? It <laughs> bit your bloody head off. Don't go near it. And I was given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And I just blew them all out of the water. In 2008, there was an instance at work which I was heavily involved in because I'd changed roles by then. And I was involved in the event. I was involved in the debrief. I did the debrief report. I interviewed loads of people. So I was kind of intimately involved in this event. And I knew loads about it. I got all the detail. I created all the reports. And somebody said to me, Paul, we've got this resilience uh, meeting uh, up in the police headquarters in a couple of weeks, would you come and do a presentation about this event? And my brain went, you can do that because you have you were there, you know all about it. Mm -hmm. So I went, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And I put some slides together, but just with pictures and a couple of words, I read some stuff about public speaking, went and did it. There were, you know, in the first meeting I'd done, there was like 40 people, it was a complete nightmare. There's about four or 500 people in this thing. And I loved it. I had a fabulous time. It was actually brilliant. And then on the back of that, 
I got invited to do three or four more of, of the same thing. And oh, it was just because my brain had been trying to protect me. Yeah. And yeah. this is the same with my client. Her brain had said that she couldn't be around men anymore because of this abusive relationship. So the subconscious mind did all of this stuff to stop her being in relationships. And I see this all the time. People, you know, stuck with stuff they don't need anymore for all kinds of odd reasons. And the, the, the worst thing is, is that they don't know why. Like yes. My client, all she knew was she couldn't stop smoking and she couldn't lose weight. That's all she knew. We had to do the work together to unpack and find that little memory, which the subconscious had made huge because it had packed it full of stuff, yeah, to make it a really big negative thing that the subconscious could latch onto. And a lot of us go through you know, life with all this stuff attached to us. And, you know, you want to start a business, you want to take up a martial art, you want to learn a language, you want to ask somebody out on a date, you want to go for a promotion, whatever it is. And you're just about to do it. And you go, nah, I won't get it. There's no, I won't, I won't get that promotion. There's no point in me talking to that good looking guy or girl over there because they're going to blow me out. And I just look a fool of myself. There's no point in me trying to lose weight because I've gone on a diet and I'll just put it up. There's no point in me doing... Uh, kung fu or mixed martial arts because I look really stupid. I'm old. I'm too fat. I'm too this. I'm too. That. And then we start making all these excuses, and we don't enjoy our lives because we stop ourselves from moving forward. And that's where I come in because I do coaching, which is getting rid of the stuff and then guiding the people forward. Yeah, but there's so many people out there that have got this, like we said, this, this huge bag of rocks. Yeah. And half the time, they don't even know they've got the huge bag of rocks. And that's the biggest shame. Because we want to give our, we want to, um, my instructor used to call it mummy love. So we want to give ourselves some mummy love, not the tough love and say, oh, it'd be okay. Oh. We make up our, like you said, those little excuses. So. <laughs> don't, don't get me started on that. Um, <laughs> when I first it's started, true, doing, right? no, when I, it's true though. When I first started yeah. doing this, I would go into groups uh, in Facebook, all the support groups for depression, anxiety, this, that, and the other, yeah. to, to offer help, to, to get some practice and to offer you know, ideas and suggestions. I got booted out of so many groups. And the reason I, why was I realized that these are support groups to help each other feel more miserable. I go, oh, my depression's worse than your depression. Now, my anxiety is worse than yours because I can't even go past this roof front door in the room. No, 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 my anxiety is a bit like a Monty Python sketch. Yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Cardboard box, yeah. bloody <laughs> lucky, and all this. For those who don't know Monty Python, look it up, yeah? Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> but it's exactly like that. And yeah. somebody coming in to offer help is the last thing they want because it's a pity party. But, and I've been in that environment as well. If you said something and it'd be like, wow, that's nothing. You, yeah, you should be, yeah, oh my gosh, and, it, and then you you get caught up in it that's the crazy thing you right. get so caught in it until you take that step away or cut someone off or whatever um but it's again it it's making that choice isn't it um it's all about the choice i mean i used to live like that for an awful long time i mean i've, I've had depression I've, I've killed myself and all sorts of stupid things mm. and it, it takes the realization that you know if you don't work, it ain't going to work, and you're meant to be here. And you, there's nothing wrong with having a pity party. If you've had a really crappy day or your girlfriend's just walked out of you, you've just been sacked, yeah, feel miserable, but don't feel miserable forever. Put a time limit on it. You know, an hour, 10 minutes, a day, a week, doesn't really matter. But at the end of that pity party, say, okay, that's the feeling sorry for myself now. I've had my pity party. I'm going to start moving forward and I'm going to start doing whatever it is I need to do to, to, to get going again. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Totally. Um, Cause I, I don't know. I, on, on my podcast, I'm always talking about the chimp paradox and I like the analogy of that is like our chimp brain is kicking off. You have got a vent. You got to get it out. Even if it's the trusted person or if it's on your own, um, it doesn't matter. But I think then that, that's when our brains can like tire that thing out. Now we can start finding that resolve and that, that way forward. And hopefully if we're in that right environment with people that, like you said, it's, 
because there's support groups that keep you there and then there's support groups that actually come on let's do this now you know let's pull you out of it let's, let's get out of it um and that's yeah i think that's the issue that there's too many of these support groups are there to keep you in and to keep the chimp active yeah you know i mean the work that i do it's not it's tough love like you mentioned earlier on Matt. Yeah. i I will drag my client kicking and screaming through the mud and the crap and the stuff to get them to where they want to be because they've spent too long not dealing with it. And I will get them to not to face the demon because I, I don't want them to relive the scenario that put them there in the first place, but to accept that something's not right and then to work with me to put it right. Yeah. Too many people just won't do that. They just want to wallow. I, I used to wallow. I used to be a world-class hippopotamus. I would lie there in a pool of self-pity, feeling sorry myself, for myself, and woe is me, nobody loves me. A real classic overacting kind of ham actor kind of scenario, you know? And that, and I still can't figure out why I did it. It didn't make me feel good. It didn't. The only benefit I can think of from being that way was it, it got me that much sympathy sometimes. And that was about it. And I think that's why these support groups survive because, oh, yeah, Paul, I really understand that, you know, you're having a tough time right now. And it never goes beyond that. And everybody keeps sort of jumping in and going, you know, oh, yeah, it's, it's, I've been there, Paul. I understand. And, yeah, when it happens to me, this, 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 and this. Yeah, yeah. We kind of take it in turns, you know, going round and round in circles, supporting each other in that respect, but not dragging people out from there and helping them move forward. Yeah. yeah not a good place to be. No. And, and the thing is, it's, it's not easy, is it, to step forward? It, it, you know, it's a decision, but it's what's harder, it's harder to stay in that environment, to stay in that mindset, though. You know, um, it's balance, isn't it? It's like it's it's hard to live like that in self pity because I've been there and I've been through the pressure. It's hard living like that. It's more tiring, but it takes yeah, it does take that effort to move out. But what's more tiring? It's staying there, isn't it? I think for a lot of people though, it's the easy. It sounds really bizarre. Oh, no, it is. It the is. easy option is to stay there and feel sorry and be drained and be upset because there's this word. It's the C word, and a lot of people are absolutely petrified of it. Are really, really petrified of it. It's the word change. Yes. I mean, all, all the gurus go, oh, change is great. Change does this and change does that and changes everything. But it's only if you're in the right frame of mind. People come to me as a last yeah. resort. They go, Paul, I've done this. I've tried this. I've tried that. Uh, I'm about to give up. They are determined that they want to move forward. Yeah. Too many people are just too scared of that word because if you think about it, change equals the unknown. Yeah, it does. It's like, well, what happens next? What happens if I do go to the gym? Will people laugh at me? Will it work? Will I lose the weight or will I just spend all day sweating and, you know, getting out of breath? If I go to this martial arts class, will they be full of like 25 year old? Uh, Bruce Lee, male and female varieties, all doing it perfectly well. Will I be the only? Will they laugh at me and all this kind of stuff? So the change is is the unknown, and for a lot of people, it's just far easier to be in this negativity than it is to actually step up and go. You know what? I've had it with this. Nothing's changed. I've been like this for five years now. It's about time I I took action and moved forward and did something. That is a very, very tough and courageous thing to do and to stick with it and to keep pushing through. Because, yeah, if you go to a martial arts class, it may well be that if you join an established class, yeah, all the people in there are, are ahead of you by a week, a month, yeah. a year, 10 years or whatever. Well, what, whatever class you go to, that's going to be the way, isn't it? You could be going yeah. to a language class, it's going to be ahead. So. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. But I'm just using uh, that as a kind of an analogy. Yeah, right? yeah, no, definitely. Uh, but it's, it is interesting because, and you're right, people do fear change. But the thing is, I have a saying, change is inevitable because it's like, if you do nothing, something will change for you anyway, whether it be your health or the people around you. But progress is optional. People don't see that, though. That's the no, issue. They, don't, they no, think no. Yeah. that if I stay in this bubble, if I you know go to work, come home, drink a bottle of wine, the takeaway, 
that's my little bubble, that's my cushion, that's my protection. And then suddenly they go to work, they get called into the office and Paul, I'm really sorry, mate, but uh, we've had a really tough time in the company. Um, I'm letting you go. And that is a massive unwanted change because they're being forced to do something now and they're not in a position to deal with it. Yeah. It's like, it's like having a, a rocket or an airplane coming through your window. It's like, oh my God, how do I deal with this kind of thing? You know, or a wild animal coming into your house. How the hell do I deal with this? And so you've been in your little pity party for five, 10, 15 years, go to work, come home, bottle of wine, go to work, come home, bottle of wine, then bang, you get hit with this. And this is what sometimes drives people to become homeless or to commit suicide or try to commit suicide or actually just drag themselves further down. With some people, it's like, wow, I've got no choice now. I have to do something. I've really got to you know, pull my socks up, socks up and get on with it. Yeah. And the, 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 that event, that scary thing of being laid off or being told you're going to get a divorce really has to really pulls you and moves you forward. And what I try to say to people is, and when I do the, the videos every morning, is that don't wait for that to happen. I'm not saying it will happen, but yeah. you don't want to wait for a, an external event to force the change. The, you want to be in as control of your life as much as possible. And if you make the change, make the decision now, then you're going to be in a much better place if something unforeseen does happen. You're going to be able to deal with it. You'll be able to, you know, like we said, have a pity party for a, a fixed period of time and then move on. Not, oh my God, what do I do now? And start pulling your hair out and spending all your money on booze and trying to run away from it. Yeah. It's like debt. One of the biggest problems when people get in debt is they don't want to accept they're in debt. They don't want to acknowledge it. They just want to pretend it's all going to be fine and it'll just go away. So all the, all the letters come through and they get put in a drawer you know, all the statements kind of put in a drawer, the phone calls get ignored, the emails get ignored until one day there's a knock on the door and the bailiffs are there, you know, because we didn't take action. I was in back in, what was it, 2011, 2010, something like that. I managed to rack up more than 50 grand's worth of debt. And it, it happened because I was, um, it was the end of the month, I had an overdraft, I went to do some shopping and long story short, I couldn't do the shopping because the I found the bank. They went, and I'll never forget this. The algorithm has no lot has decided that you are no longer worthy of having an overdraft. So we've stopped it. They hadn't written to me, hadn't given you warning, it just bang. Mm. And that was a real shock to the system. And it meant that I had to deal with it. I'd been dealing with it in that, you know, I had an overdraft and everything was sorted out, but I hadn't made the decision to deal with the debt. Yeah. Then I had to, and it took me nearly seven years, but I paid back every penny because I had to, you know, I, that's the situation. I didn't want to be made bankrupt. I didn't want to have all this negativity around. So, okay, it's going to be really tough, but I'm going to do it. And I paid it all back, every single penny. And I felt really good when I got the call to say the last payment had gone through and I had a little party, you know, because, oh, yeah, I'd just done that. I've really achieved something. It's a meg mega thing. Yeah. But too many people wait until they get the knock on the door from the bailiffs coming to take the car away or whatever it is they've come for, you know, rather than actually facing up to it. It's, it's making the decision to face up to your situation is critical. It really, really is. Definitely. I've had similar situations, it sounds like. Uh, but it is, it's really empowering. When, and, and I think when you make that decision and, and when you get to the, that result, it is so empowering. Um, and it's, it, again, it's, it's, it's suddenly, it's not like you've taken a stone out either. You've taken quite a few out. Oh yeah. You've emptied the rucksack out pretty much. Yeah, definitely. Because you've yeah. made, you've done two things. In fact, you've done three things. I call it, um, I was trying to think of an acronym the other day. You've recognized mm. that you've got a problem. You've accepted that you've got a problem and that's his rad so you recognize you accept and then you do something about it yeah. yeah yeah and when you do something about it even though the problem isn't resolved there's a huge sigh of relief 
because it's not hidden anymore. It's out in the open. You've ac you've recognised you've got a problem. Yeah, I've got this debt. I've got all these piles of letters, and you accept it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's me. It's my debt. It's not your debt. Not some person that's been stealing my credit card. It's down to me. Yeah. And then you do something about it. You start making phone calls. You start reading the letters. You start dealing with it. And then the, the, the weight just falls away because you're, you are now in control of the situation. You've taken the steps to deal with things, whether that's, you know, losing weight, getting rid of debt, uh, getting out of a bad relationship, whatever it is, you're taking control and you feel so much better for it. And then when you're out of the situation, it's like, yeah, I did this, me. Yes. And it's like, you know, winning, scoring the, the winning goal at the FA Cup final or, you know, scoring a hole in one at golf if you play golf. It's that kind of feeling because, yeah, that was me. I did that. Okay, yeah, I should have put myself in that situation, but that's by the by. But, yeah. I, you know, I yeah. recognised it, I accepted it, and I did something about it. Yeah. Exactly. It is what it is, and now you can move on, right? Well, that's, our, that's the top tip, really, isn't it? To Rad for... Um, yeah. For the subject of today's show, which is I can't even think of the word for it. <laughs> uh, removing mental baggage. Yeah. So, yeah, then that's really good. And I really like the um, I like the one with the shower as well. So that's a just thing that's people. An start. Easy thing anybody easy, can do. Yeah, yeah, easy one. Um, I was going to say something. So, ah, uh, yeah. So, Paul, you mentioned about your video, and I wanted to bring that up. So, you're doing mindset videos. Is it every day? Every day, uh, about 7.30 in the morning, I go live on my Facebook page. Um, I cover a whole range of things because I specialize in dealing with imposter syndrome, which is, you know, feeling like a fake, feeling that as soon as you're going to do something, people are going to start nitpicking at you and, oh, God, what's he doing? Why is he doing that? And all this kind of stuff, yeah? And fear of failure, fear of success, uh, pro the devil's triangle, I call it, yeah? These three things are like symptoms of imposter syndrome. Procrastination perfectionism and paralysis are overwhelm. you know yeah. it's these three things that can will hold us back and we think oh, i'm a procrastinator i'm a perfectionist i just struggle with overwhelm they're just the symptoms yeah of something else which is generally some kind of imposter syndrome or fear of failure kind of thing you know and people deal with people put up with them oh, i'm a procrastinator i'm a perfectionist you know i, I can never move forward because i'm doing this that and the other but so yeah I do a video every single morning around something to do with mindset. Yeah, I might not call it mindset, but it'll be yeah. something along those lines. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so make sure you subscribe to Paul, and that's on your just um, your personal profile, isn't it? Uh, I've got all the I've got a, you know I've got a business page, personal profile, YouTube channel. If you go to my personal profile, then you can find all the other stuff, and you can binge watch me to your heart's content. I wouldn't recommend it though. That's on YouTube, right? I'm on YouTube, but I've got links to my YouTube channel and stuff like that on my yeah. Facebook uh, personal profile. You can find me Excellent. there. Excellent. And um, how are you coaching? At, um, are you coaching through Zoom at the moment? Pretty much, or how are you doing uh, your coaching? <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny you should say that because I've been doing, I see most, I see, in fact, I see all of my clients now pretty much on Zoom. And yeah. I've been doing that for about a year or so. Yeah. Because what I found is that clients feel much more comfortable in their own space and they feel much more relaxed and open to talk to me about stuff rather than sort of coming to my, my room and dealing with things there. Yeah. And I don't mind. If someone wants to come yeah, and work with yeah. me face to face, perfect. But if they want to do it via Zoom, I mean, I've got clients in Australia, the States, Europe, South Africa, which is fine by me. Because obviously there's no way I'm flying to Australia to, to work with a client <laughs> unless they pay me big, 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 big bucks, yeah? But doing it via Zoom, yeah. piece of cake. Well, that's good to know. I've been getting viewers from Indonesia, India, and Brazil recently. Yeah. That's pretty cool, cool, yeah. So Brilliant. No, uh, that's good. That's the power of the... Um, that's the great thing about, um, you know, internet. And But you, you kind of were on this before the whole COVID thing anyway, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it just happened by accident. A client said to me, I can't, I'm just too busy, Paul. I can't get to you. I really want to work. I can't get to you. I said, look, you got, you got a laptop at home. Yes, Paul. Yes, I have. Do you know what Zoom is? Well, I use it at work every day. Okay, how about then, rather than you slipping all the way down to come and work with me, we meet on Zoom. And she went, that's a great idea. Let's do that. I've got myself a new client. 
and then you know it just kind of snowballed from there. Brilliant, brilliant. This, sir, uh, I've um, we're coming to an end. I have thoroughly enjoyed tonight's show. Me too. Love, Thank you. I'd love to get you back on. I'd love, we'd have to maybe work out collaboration at some point, but um, that's been really. I, I've got I've got loads from that. <laughs> so, every time I have a guest, it's like I got I got some more got some more tools. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what it's about, isn't it? You you learn and you, you evolve that way, I guess. So it's um, Tony Robbins. We talked about him just before we came live on air. Yeah, yeah. He's got this thing called Canny C A N I constant and never-ending improvement you know continually learn how there used to be this cliche you can't teach an old dog new tricks well, that's mm. wrong the scientists have demonstrated now that providing you you treat your brain like a muscle you can learn new things you can learn two three four five ten languages and you can do that in your 90s providing you stimulate your brain you keep fit and healthy and you work your brain so yeah just just constantly be, keep that curiosity we are curious beings if we weren't curious we'd still be living in caves or in the treetops like chimps but it's our curiosity that and our imaginations that drove us from the trees to spread across the world to live in skyscrapers at bloody half a mile high whatever they are yeah, yeah. so keep learning keep interested be, still be curious actually paul you reminded me of something and you brought this up on um the mastermind i think it it was a couple of weeks back and, and I think we were talking about learning on there and some audio books and I don't know if someone made a comment, oh, I can't, because sometimes my, my brain zones out and I switch off, but you actually made a really interesting comment and, I, and I've been trying to work that, is that even if you're zoned out, still have that going on because something will go in, is that? Yeah, if, yeah, I, get, I, see what you, I, I can't remember yeah. the exact thing that I said, but even if you are zoned out and you're in a bad place or whatever, push yourself to listen to audio books or read. Mm. Stay away from daytime TV because that's just garbage, most of it. But if you read uh, podcasts, there's loads of really interesting podcasts now. They're free, they're easily accessible. So you can still feed your mind, even though you might not be in a good place. And you never know, there might be one little shift Somebody might say something, a little sentence or a throwaway word. And you went, oh, my God, I could do that. Like, yeah. And it, it just sinks in because the, the brain is always on, on alert for predators. But also, if you stay curious and stay interested in life, it's also on the lookout for opportunities. Yeah, it's the difference between a closed mindset and an open mindset. A closed mindset sees everything as negative and doesn't look outward. An open mindset goes, yeah, opportunities, people to talk to, things to learn about, curiosity, interest, you know, and using that imagination. That's where we want to be. We want to have the open mindset because that helps us learn and grow and be happier and lead better lives. No, definitely. Do you know what? That helped me loads when you said that because um because when I'm listening to my order, I feel like I've got to get all this information in. I got to get it there. And actually, I thought, actually, no. I, you know, from not from my head somewhere else when I'm walking in. So that's generally when I got my audios on. I thought, no, I'm just going to put it in. So, I, or from the car. So that, that helps a lot, actually. And you're right about the open mindset. I had this um, analogy given to me a few years back. I, I loved it. It just it changed my perception on everything. And it was, what is one plus one? Well, we've been Dude. taught. It's two, we've right? Told, we've been, yeah. yeah, we've been taught that it's two because if we get a car, another car, we got two cars. We get one cup and one other cup, we got two cups. But if we get one puddle and another puddle and put them together, we got... A bigger puddle. Yeah, we've got one puddle. <laughs> so it's, um, and it's just that little thing um, changes everything. So there's always an answer. There's always a way around. And it's, it is about that open mindset, definitely. And, I, and I, mine was used to be so closed. It was... <laughs> it's terrible but how far we've all come really so yeah, but it's like you said right at the start of this conversation you know if you're surrounded by negative people yeah. then your brain goes sh bang, yeah. and yeah. shuts if it wasn't already shut and it, it can't open because it's just there's too much stuff holding it closed and you've got to let go of that negativity so give yourself chance to to open your mind and to start looking for more things out of life 
yeah definitely well i, I always say um it, it's the top five people that you're around is who you become so it's good to an analyze that sometimes and you know seek out a bit like what we've done we seeked out a, a mastermind group and it's you know with, with quite a few unique minds in there and you know we we pick up off on that and that's the energy to be around isn't it there's people that you know are wanting to grow and develop and you'll pick up off from there the best support groups yeah yeah this that is that is the best support group you can have is being around people that will push you will stimulate you will help you and you kind of reciprocate it's a group of people that okay they could be in different businesses different areas different countries yeah, yeah. but they're all, they've all got one aim it's to go from here to here yeah? yeah and you you can get yourself into a group of people like that they will kind of drag you along and you will drag somebody else along as well yeah. whereas yeah. if you're in a bunch of people that are just like this you know like the, the whingers down the pub every pub has a whinger nothing yeah. is ever right you know the beer's too warm it's too yeah, noisy yeah. the food's crap the day at work was bad and they just pull everybody down yeah. in the pub okay and you imagine you've got five or six people like that in your life and it's just constantly doing this to you pushing you down and pushing you down and like you said earlier it's putting stuff in the, putting rocks in that rucksack definitely definitely and if you can't find one create one yeah <laughs> listen and yeah. um, there's a guy called napoleon hill yes wrote, yeah. wrote a book called think and grow rich mm -hmm. and one of the best things in that book was the mastermind i think that may be where the phrase came from i think it um, is yeah and basically what he said was look you might not be able to get to be with industrialists and mega entrepreneurs but you can if you use your imagination so imagine a a table you know like a, a king arthur and the knights of the round table or a boardroom table you know oh, let's get this up like that yeah put some seats around it like that it must be imaginary seats and then put a person in each of those seats so for example if you know someone like say rob moore who's a very successful entrepreneur he could be the chairman of your board and then if you're looking to build a relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever find yourself someone in the world who's good at that and put them as a board member and go around filling these chairs these seats with the people you think you need advice from yeah and then what you do is you sit down somewhere quiet and you close your eyes and then you start to imagine that you're sitting in the boardroom you've got a place in this boardroom as well and you're surrounded by the five six ten however many people it is and they are giving you advice and you ask a question, okay, look, I really want to start my own business. What's the best way to do it? And then you can go around the table and let each one of the members of your mastermind tell you, give them that your view. And yeah, okay, there aren't 12 people in your head. It's your subconscious mind that you're working with. But what you're doing is you're pulling all these different people you've heard from in the past. You're pulling all the books you've read, all the knowledge you've gained, all the podcasts you've watched, the movies, et cetera, yeah? And you're pulling that knowledge and you're creating these imaginary, real characters, but imaginary in your head. And it's a great way to have your own, you know, mastermind. If you haven't got the money to join one or you don't want to form a physical one. And it works. I did it for a long while. And that, that helped me enormously like get out yeah. of my funk. It really, yeah. really does work. That's the power of having podcasts as well, because you can select the different ones and you, you, you kind of have got that almost caught that mastermind now definitely but yeah there's, there's a yeah. podcast on pretty much every single yeah, really. subject from i don't know from animal husbandry to zoology and yeah, everything definitely. in between you can find a podcast to fit your interests and there's probably more than one so it's a really good way to feed your mind and to learn and to discover new things absolutely definitely definitely and you got to keep it learning because otherwise it starts to go we get rusty so yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah paul um thank you so much um, my pleasure I'd, sir i'd my love pleasure. to get you back on and uh, guys you got you got a bit extra bonus content there so uh all good um if you've enjoyed if you've got any questions for paul or myself drop them in the comments uh you've got paul's website there but connect with him on facebook please he's doing mindset um 
every every day, every morning, half past seven. Is that right? That's right. Around about half past seven every single morning. So it's definitely a great way to set yourself up for the day ahead. I'll see you all next week. Thank you, Paul. I'll talk to you in just a sec. Uh, everyone else, have a enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Peace, love, always. Bye-bye.